of odor laden air. And you can vary the concentration by the use of flow meters uh, any way you want. And you can calculate, the big advantage of these is that you can calculate the molecular concentration. You know how many molecules of air there are going in every minute to the system? And you know how many molecules of, uh, of odor there are going into that odor stream? And you can calculate how many molecules of odor are actually reaching the uh, area where the head is held. Most of these nowadays are done by having the whole head into an odor area. Here's a plexiglass thing, the human being is smelling inside of here, the air is going in here, and the bottom of it is where the air goes out. The person sits in the odor hood, call an odor hood, and breathes normally. And as he's breathing normally, uh, we change the concentration of odor materials, and he is required to state there is an odor, or there's not an odor, or the difference in odors, it can be done for that, or the relation of one odor to the next, you can shift from one odor to the other very quickly. Or you can have binary mixtures, or even tertiary mixtures, these are being made for. So they're a very useful tool. There are two or three of them on the campus now. Uh, those of you who've had Dr. Russell's course knows he's made a small, rather portable one. Uh, there's a quite large one uh, over in uh, the Enology building. We used to give a, um, uh, a, um, a class on this, but we're not going to this year. Uh, you have to, a certain amount of practice is necessary. Some people can't, um, can't do these uh, odor, if you were ever going to measure odor thresholds by this method, uh, you'll find that you'll find some people have claustrophobia. They can't put their neck under, their head under a plexiglass hood. They, they just go all to pieces. Their thresholds will be seemingly high. Uh, I had a technician one time, Ms. Shrapkin, who uh, would actually cry before she would go and take the odor test. So we, we finally let her, let her off. We didn't. <laughs> <laughs> now the other thing is sniffing, uh, where you have an odor and here you make different concentrations of the odor by dilution. Uh, in some uh, media where the odor will stay, and you keep them covered up uh, all the time, and then you have odor-laden air of a certain concentration, you open the vessel and sniff, and then close the vessel, and you find your threshold by going up and down a scale of dilutions of the odor material. It's rather crude. Uh, you don't know how much odor material there is. Some people have big sniffs, some have little sniffs, and so forth. But it gives an approximation of the threshold. And it's been very much used, very widely used, uh, used for, for a large number of different kinds of uh, purposes. In doing these uh, thresholds and intensities, you have to be very sure that you have pure compounds. Uh, they have to be purified and repurified. In some cases, they deteriorate uh, in as short a period of time as two hours. So that after you've purified it, you have to complete your test in two hours or make some more uh, material. We've already talked about hunger, the time of day, individual variation. And I won't say anything about equal intensity of different odors. I add a couple of things on another thing here. How much? Does it take to trigger off the olfactory, the smell? It's been estimated by fairly accurately that 40 sense cells each must absorb a single molecule. 40 sense cells must each absorb a single molecule before you trigger off a specific odor. Now that's pretty good. Uh, there is no GLCs, no gas liquid chromatography apparatuses that we have today that will pick up 40 molecules. Uh, not only will it pick up 40 molecules, but it will tell you what they are. It will tell you whether they're mercaptan of one kind or another. Uh, so that uh, we're not as sensitive to odor as we are to vision, but we're almost as sensitive uh, to it. Remember I told you nine seven or nine quanta of light will trigger off a light reaction. And here's 40 molecules of um, odor materials to do that. 
Let me just finish now by the, the last part of this lecture, which has to do with the odor theories. The broad general classification of odor theories is that they could be caused by direct radiation from an odorous source. And the objection to that theory is that you smell odors downwind. So if they had radiation effects, you should smell them upwind, but you don't. Also, you can't react, you can't reflect odors off of a surface, or they do not refract through a transparent medium. So we don't think that it's due to radiation from odorous sources. The second theory is the one that we've just discussed a few minutes ago uh, and has many variations. I'll give you two variations. It's called chemical reactivity as a source of theory of odor. The theory A is that olfactory response is set off by enzyme-catalyzed reactions. The odorant, for example, might inhibit the action of one or more enzymes. And this would shift the uh, concentrations of basic smell substances at the olfactory epithelium. And these differences in concentrations would then trigger off impulses to the first cranial nerve. The objection to this particular enzyme theory is that it cannot account for the extreme sensitivity and rapidity for olfactory responses. Hundreds of a second, if you recall, 0.02 seconds for an electrical response. And also the rapidity with which they are erased. Enzyme reactions, if they got started, ought to continue but after you smell an odor instantaneously, it just like it wipes itself off. Now, an enzyme reaction doesn't stop that way. And, and so how can you account for a smell on the enzyme reaction? Because it just doesn't stop that fast. The other one is the one I gave you of AMOR, stereochemical theories. That's 2B, theories coming under chemical reactivity. I've already indicated that's an old one. The odor molecules are supposed to fit the receptor site. They may or may not do that. As Gelhard says very cryptically, this theory demands that an odorant gets its quality by not only landing in its proper site, but as to the attitude it assumes on landing. Uh, and that's exactly what uh, Amor's problem is, that he can't account for all these variations, so he has to go into all kinds of subtle things. The third theory postulates that there is a vibrational interchange between the odorous vapor and the nostrils. These are called radiation mechanisms within the nostrils. Once the odor vapor has come into proximity with the olfactory epithelium, could there be any vibrational interchange between the odor vapor in the nostrils and the sensitive tissue surface? Now, there are a lot of different theories. This Raman shift, or Raman shift, has been proposed then propose that the odorous molecule vibrates with a period equal to that of the ultraviolet light that they absorb. The, the human body is an uh, infrared uh, emitting organism. The infrared absorbing characteristics might have something to do it. Unfortunately, all of these stereochemical things fall down, as I just said before, because stereoisomers do not fit them. And stereoisomers generally have the same uh, uh, infrared spectrum, the same Raman shift, and so forth. And that'll give us the last two slides, and then we'll be done for today. You want to show us the last two? Well, this just shows you how complicated a thing like uh, bananas is. All of these compounds uh, present bananas. The next one, I think, is strawberries. Hundreds of different compounds. The other direction. And here's the. This is the one for strawberry oils. All these different compounds go together to make what we call strawberry odors. So strawberry is not a pure odor. The next one is the, is the infrared spectrum now. I think. That's still no. This is a Cabernet Sauvignon grape. You'd expect me to have something about grapes in the lecture. Uh, see how complicated the odors of Cabernet grapes are. And the last one is the infrared spectrum of three. Uh, just forget that. We just did that one. We just did it. Oh, there isn't one there that shows some lines going up and down? Should be. 
Well, anyway, forget it. The infrared spectrum for three different compounds are shown in the slide, and they all are almost exactly superimposable. You know what an infrared spectrum is? It has a lot of peaks going across an area that long. You can, you can hardly tell them apart, and yet they all three have different odors. So if infrared spectrum is going to explain some radiation effect between the epithelial surface and a certain kind of odor, it's got to be darn specific and more specific than anything that we can postulate at the moment. Don't forget the laboratory tomorrow. Ms. Pangborn will be here on Thursday.